Shalom Chavrim, I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live, and today we have a very special guest, uh, Dr. Stephen Pidgeon, up in Washington State, and delighted to have him today. He is uh, uh, president of the Et Sefer uh, Publishing Group. Incredible work that they do there, and we're going to get into this whole issue uh, about Russia, the biblical passages that are relating to things that we're seeing today, all this... Uh, I don't know how you would call it, but just animosity towards Russia, this outright uh, Russia phobia, you might say, that we're, that we're seeing. And as we mentioned on our broadcast the other day, this really doesn't seem to make sense because we are living in an age to where uh, the United States, considered to be a Christian nation, and Russia, who has been all these years in communism under the atheistic leaders that were uh, Jesuits, uh, Vladimir Lenin and, and Joseph St uh, Stalin, and the country coming out of that and the first president that actually publicly begins to take a strong stand uh, for Christianity once again, and that was President Putin. And no, I'm not on the Kremlin uh, uh, pay list and, uh, and, 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 you know, but we are believers as well and we want to stand with other believers around the world so we're going to take a look into some of these things biblically what's going on with all the tensions that are rising in the world right now nearly seeming to be on the edge of a war uh, and a war that could easily drag Russia right into the middle of it. We wondered about Syria, and Syria is still on the table. We have North Korea, we have China and Russia both bringing down missiles and troops uh, on their border, seemingly to pr protect North Korea in the event that the U.S. strikes North Korea. Uh, and at the same time, we see so much where President uh, Trump has tried to soften the issue with, with Russia and try to bring about some peace, but being headed off in every direction. Uh, so anyway, without any further ado, I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Steve Pigeon. Dr. Steve Pigeon, thank you for joining us today here on Israeli News Live. Well, it's great to be with you again, Stephen. It's always good to join Israeli News Live for these kinds of conversations. Thank you. And Steve, if you would, I'd like for you to tell, tell the people a little bit about uh, the work that you guys are doing in, in the background there. Uh, I shouldn't say in the background, in the foreground, because I know you, you're, you're an attorney as well. Uh, but uh, you and uh, Brad have done remarkable work in your team there in uh, re restoring uh, some of the books that used to be part of the canon of the Bible. Well, I have to tell you, Stephen, we are extremely excited right now. I mean, both Brad and I are very excited about where we're going, uh, particularly over the last couple of months as we, you know, we're always working with the text. I mean, every day we're embroiled in the text one way or the other, looking, looking and looking and looking and trying to discover what is there in, in order to restore a more perfect text. We're not there yet, but we're closing in. And so, you know, our general manager looks at us and says, you know, look, we're not going to revise the book every third month. You know, you're going to have to kind of stick with what you're doing for a while. And we're actually very happy with our uh, third edition. It's very, very solid, very strong. We're very happy with it. But we have discovered some things that are just even more amazing and more significant and uh, really uh unfolding, capable of unfolding new prophecy and new prophetic insight because of what's there in the text. And it's it's funny because when you go back and restore what's there, not add to it, but restore what's there, these things emerge. Uh, I'll give you an example. We were looking at uh, the word teraphim. Well, you know, Raquel, when she leaves with, uh, with her husband, Yaakov, she takes some of her father's idols, some of Laban's idols. And, and, and he comes out and says, hey, who took my teraphim? And, you know, she says, well, you're going to, you know, it's, she had it stored in the camel furniture where he couldn't find it. And so I'm looking at this, so what is this teraphim? So we looked and looked and looked. And there's a word, of course, that appears in the Hebrew that we have called the chimera, the chimera. Well, a chimera is kind of an interesting thing, too, because we know a chimera now is like a half breed, half human, half horse or something, a chimera. But in this particular case, it was talking about something shrunken. And so I looked at the Targum on some of the Torah and discovered that these teraphim are in fact shrunken heads, shrunken heads, yeah. Laban shrunken heads. And they would, they would take, and it was a particular shrunken head. It had to be the head of the firstborn male child who, had, who was sacrificed as an adult over 20 years old. 
Then they would take the head and they'd remove the skull bone and they'd keep the flesh and they would sew it up with a gold coin right in its mouth and it would have an inscription on the coin. And then they would hang this head and they would talk to the head. So this was kind of their necromancy, if you will. They would talk to the shrunken head mm -hmm. and this was how they communed with the dead. It was very important that it be a, a, a firstborn male child, adult child who had been sacrificed. So you know they had human sacrifice going on up there in Lebanon where Laban was. They had human sacrifice going on and it was common for them to have the teraphim, these shrunken heads. And this is what Raquel took with her. And that's one. And then, of course, the discovery of the Ophanim. You know, you, when you talk about the wheels, right, the wheel within a wheel, what we discovered was the word there is Ophanim, Ophanim. And it really talks more about a species of angel, if you will. And that Ophanim is kind of like, um, I don't know if you ever saw the videos of there was a video was taken of a UFO that came down over the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. There were yeah. three different videos of it. And when it came down, it was kind of a, it was kind of a tetrazoid there. It was off angle and it was spinning and it would spin and it somehow adjusted its, its angles as it was over the top of the mountain. And then suddenly, boom, it went up into the sky in, in a split second. But there were three different videos of the same event. And that idea of that, that square thing spinning, right? The wheel within the wheel. This is probably a closer visual of what an ophanim is than anything else. So when we discover these things, of course, we make these revisions. And so the Etz affair right now is really in its best condition ever. Uh, you know, the, the printing is being done by Thompson Shore. They're doing a great job. It's a stitched book. You know, they, they actually sew the signatures, they call them. It has a leather cover on it. And so it's a very high quality, long enduring book. And um, it is, you know, it's a comprehensive restoration of sacred scriptures. Now, a lot of people say, you know, we've suffered a great deal of criticism. There's always people out there that want to, you know, tear us down, you know, rake us over the coals or whatever. But the truth is the alternatives here are, you, you know, you used to have a 1560 Geneva that was a great Bible. You can't get that anymore. If you get a Geneva, you're going to get the 1599, which is a redacted book with only 66 books. If you get the, the 1611 KJV AV, it had all of the Apocrypha. You, you, you can get that, but people don't. They buy the 1789 Benjamin Blaney because that has the more modern English. You're not reading that really archaic English. But the archaic English in the KJV used the word Iesus, not Jesus. It used Iesus, as did the 1560 Geneva. Those books aren't available for your consumption anymore, at least not on the mass market. And then the Bibles that are typically used in the United States, the mainstream Bibles like the NIV or the ASB or the NASB or the ESV, those texts are all based upon the Westcott and Hort uh, corrected text. And that corrected text, they use the Codex Sinaiticus as its foundation. Well, the Codex Sinaiticus has been proven to be a forgery. There was only one copy. It was found burning in a trash can when it was found. And when it was found, the guy who had forged it admitted that he had forged it. It's inconsistent with the Codex Vaticanus at least 3,000 times in the Gospels alone. And yet, and this text redacts so much information concerning the deity of Mashiach that you have to ask yourself the question, was there an agenda here in that text? Now, let's look at the fruit of those Bibles that have been used, these highly redacted 66 book Bibles that have had numerous scriptures redacted and many scholars who have come out and said, oh, the bit about the adulterous woman who was accused, that was added. The text in, in 1 John 5 that says there are three that agree in heaven, that was added. One fellow said virtually all of the words of Christ were added to the text. So once you start, you know, pull out your razor blade and you start redacting, you can get down to where, you know, arguably you get down to the Torah. That's it. Everything else is gone. <laughs> Yeah, right. Well, you know, do not add to, do not take from. Exactly, and and let me just share something with you, friends that are listening uh, to what Doctor Pigeon is saying here. This is what's so important and so invaluable to me as I do my own research and, and my own studies as well. Is that as I'm looking in 
the original language. Um, now, of course, I don't know Greek. Uh, Yana has studied Koine Greek extensively herself, uh, but for me, Hebra Hebraic language is, is my specialty, my study that I, that I spent uh, a number of years studying now. And I'm looking and I see consistently with translators, although maybe they had the best intentions in the world, you can see that it is a doctrinal biased translation in some areas. Now, not every area, by, by no means, but some areas it's obvious. As I have shared with you guys recently about the book of Daniel, as, I, as I'm seeing this, and sometimes maybe it's not so much that, it's, that they're trying to be biased, but it's just what at that time they believed that the way the prophecy is perceived. And we find that in the case of Daniel 11 verse 40. Uh, recently, when I discovered in there uh, that it's not that the king of the south is pushing at the king of the north, but with him. It's emo, and you can't translate emo as at him. It is with him. There's no other way to translate the word correctly. correctly. And it completely alters uh, the, the pr prophetic implications of the verse itself. Uh, so this is why I have such a passion for the Sefer. And the work that uh, Dr. Pigeon and Brad are doing there in, in this tireless uh, efforts that they go forth. And even this, the next editions that come out, that's another thing that I really appreciate. It may, it may seem like, well, why do you have to keep doing that? But you know, as you discover more, as we see more of the translations that need to be dealt with, uh, it's important to us because we begin to see more, we begin to learn more. And... I want to just share with you as well, before we get into our broadcast today, you know, you can actually order the, the, the Sefer from uh, Sefer.net, uh, at Sefer.net. Is that correct, Steve? It's uh, no, just Sefer.net, C-P-H-E-R.net. Yes, and if you go on there, if you there is a way you can put in a code for a discount. All you have to do is put in INL for Israeli News Live, and they're going to give you a discount. And at the same time, it blesses the work that we do here because it helps support what we're doing here. So we appreciate that. If especially if you feel like that you really want to add uh, this to your own library for being able to study a great study tool as well as. Uh, Steve has brought out those books that were once part of our canon that have been removed over time there. Uh, and those are so valuable, like in the case of, uh, of, of Yasher, you know, or the book of Jasher, as you may say in, the, in modern English. You know, how many times have I found places in the book of, uh, of, of Jasher where it helps to corroborate uh, maybe a misunderstanding that we have in our own canon, such as, was it the Midianites or the Canaanites, uh, or excuse me, the Ishmaelites or the Midianites that Joseph was sold to? Because in our own canon, we're not really sure. One place we have, uh, they, he was sold to the Midianites, and another place he was sold to the Ishmaelites. Well, the book of Jasher actually explains it in detail and clarifies it. So it's not even a it's not a, uh, what would you call that? It's, it's, it's not a, a mistake in the Bible or anything like that. It, it, there is a lot to it, but you have to read into it. I don't want to get into it. I'll be here all night trying to explain all this here. Uh, right. Uh, right. So. When, you, when you talk about Yashar, I have to tell you, Brad and I were talking about this last night. Just an incredible discovery. There's a passage in Yashar, 47, I think it's 47, 14, but it's the story where uh, Yosef, Joseph, is going to rise up mm -hmm. into power in Egypt. But in order to do so, he has to conquer all 72 languages of the known world. Yes. And so here he is. And so he is, he doesn't know how he's going to do this, but there's 72 steps he has to climb in order to be next to uh, the Pharaoh. And that night, it says an angel camp comes to him and downloads the 72 languages to him. And then it says, because of this, you are now Yahoo Seth. Now, there's only one other place in all of scripture that this word Yahusef appears. It appears there in, in Joshua 47, 14, but then you also see it in Psalm 81, verse five. And it talks about, this was the time of Yahusef when he heard languages that he did not know. And so this, for me, this is a particular corroboration that is, is up in such incredible power and authority talking about this simple word, Yahusef, but the whole concept of the languages and the importance of Psalm 81. Psalm 81 is where we get this idea of where the month begins on the dark moon, 
which again, it's a single witness, right? So when you have only a 66 book canon, there's many passages that have only a single witness. You know, Paul says, Moses withstood Janus and Jambres. That's one, that's the only place you find Janus and Jambres in the text. And you have uh, David saying in Psalm 81, well, you know, we have this on the dark moon, you know, blow the shofar on the dark moon on our solemn feast day. That's a single witness or the witness in Genesis 6, 1. You know, this is when the, when the, the sons of Elohim came down and had relations with human women. Single witness. Now that allows a pastor or a manipulator of scripture to tell whatever story he wants to tell. Because it's a single witness, he can pivot in any direction. When you add the second witness of Hanol, the second witness of Yovelin, the second witness of Yashar, the second witness of Second Baruch, the second witness of Fourth Ezra, when you start to add those second witnesses, what do you discover? You discover the second witness and the truth of the conviction that Hanok says, yeah, the month begins on the dark moon, right? And Jasher says, yeah, the Yahusef was when Yosef conquered the 72 languages of the known world. And, you know, it's in Enoch that we have the story of the watchers. And, you know, as we look at this, you know, Jude, in the book of Jude, he quotes Enoch directly. We also found something else, which is that Jasher, Yashar, is quoted word for word in the book of Ezekiel. And so these things we're discovering little by little. And so you see these things, you say, well, why should I have these books? These books are extra scriptural. Nobody canonized them. Remember who canonized scripture, who yes. said these are permissible for you to read and these are impermissible for you to read. That was Rome who said that. That's right. That was Rome who said that. And people say, well, are you trying to say these books are inspired? They did not use inspiration for their criteria for accepting books in the New Testament. They used what Alexandria was using, and that was their thinking. Yes. So when you talk about all these kinds of issues, it becomes really important. Now, you're one of the things I so much love about Israeli News Live is that because of your uh, scholarship, you have been willing to look at a text and say, let's see if there's indicia of veracity inside the text. Now, you know, for some people, that's too much. They want to say, look, tell me what the answer is so I don't have to think. Well, that isn't what the et sefer is about. The et sefer is not about you being told what to do, you being programmed, and then you go home and regurgitate it to your friends. The et sefer is for the thinking person, Romans 12, 2, renew your mind. How are you going to renew your mind when you have a pastor telling you, don't read that, don't read this, don't read that? You know how many churches I've been in where they claim to be a New Testament church. They will not read the book of Revelation. They will not read the book of Jude. They will not read the book of James. They don't want to hear that stuff. They don't want to hear that faith without works is dead. They don't want to hear that. No, they don't. They don't want to hear the passages in 1 John that, this is the love of God is keeping his commandments. No, that, but that stuff's off the table. Let's go back to talking about the Good Samaritan and then let's harbor in on everything's nailed to the cross. And Galatians says that, you know, you guys are free to do whatever you want. <laughs> so, but you're right, Steve. You are so, you are so right. And, and people are, they're just not interested in the word of God. And, uh, and, to a very sad extent, but but the thing is, is what's really nice is we do have, and and as you know, there are tens of thousands of people that do want to know the truth, and they do have hungry minds, and I'm finding that more and more day after day. I like yourself, Steve. We get those uh, naysayers that come on all the time, you know, that try to ridicule what we're doing and stuff like that, and oh my gosh, you got to watch out for this guy. He's a he's a heretic and all that kind of thing, but. You know, the point is, is we care about people, we care about the truth, and we want to do everything we can to uh, to bring this to people's attentions and to get the people to really to search on their own. Because I'm no better than anybody else, and God will reveal himself to anybody that is serious, that really wants to know things. And, and that's what I really appreciate about uh, the work that you guys are doing there. So, you know, friends, if you're, if you really are serious about studying, you know, and, and you, if you, if you're, if you want to take it at the mindset that, you know, you know, I, I feel comfortable with the canon, the canon is there. It's all in the book, in the Sefer as well. The whole canon is there. But what, what it does, it gives you that extra insight 
that was was there as part of the uh, KJV at one time. Uh, it was there, and they had that uh, just a couple of hundred years ago, and that gives us the opportunity to just to dig a little bit deeper. You know, and that's what I look at. Even like the Book of Enoch, you know, uh, the Book of Enoch I don't think was part of the, uh, the the 1611, but it was in the canonical scrolls at Qumran. Uh, and I know some people they look at that and they say, well, I can't believe that the that the fallen angels were really as tall as what Enoch says. Well, you know, it also says though that those fallen angels were able to transform their appearance. Uh, and there's other historical writings that say that that's exactly what they did and made themselves appear as if they were these women's husbands. So no, it wasn't some 300 foot tall giant that came down and slept with the women, but the, the ability to transform, to look like their husbands. In other words, they came down and looking like guys that maybe are between five foot five and maybe six foot, you know, and that's what they were able to do. Uh, so, so you know, it really you have to be a, a th really critical in thinking to be able to uh, to do this. But I, I think it's it's a blessing. Uh, Steve, let's let's uh, if you would tell the people again how they can order the Ed's Affair, and uh, then I'm ready to get into this whole issue about what's happening prophetically when it comes to the United States, where we're at in time, uh, what's going on with Russia, North Korea, biblically, the rest of the world, uh, and get your insight on some of these things. You bet. Sure. If, to order the Et Sefer or the lexicon or the cover, the tabs, or even our extra Et Sefrim for extra reading, you just go to sefer.net, C-E-P-H-E-R.net, and you can order right there. If you have questions, uh, just uh, email customer service at sefer.net. If you have questions you want to direct to me, Stephen at sefer.net. That's with Stephen with a P-H. Fa Stephen. Fa Stephen. P-H. Stephen. No, I'm kidding. It's S T E P H E N at Zephyr. <laughs> by, by the way, the Ed Zephyr means the book. For those of you that don't know the Hebrew and why that, that is uh, chosen, no doubt, but that's what it actually means. It's Zephyr. So, all right, let's get into this, Steve. So much going on, and I want to just kind of real quick uh, show one article that I just seen came out uh, today. This was on the war zone. Uh, Russian air base in Syria seems to be under regular attack now. Uh, these rebels, again, have been shelling uh, the base there, and I'm going to kind of blow up this article real quick. Uh, this is just one of many of the, uh, the hot spots following a deadly attack on Russia's uh, uh, Khamim Air Base in Syria on December 31st, which killed at least two servicemen and damaged or destroyed aircraft base there. It now seems that his uh, base is coming under attack on a fairly regular basis. Now, by the way, when they say regular basis, before coming on the broadcast, within one hour of coming on the broadcast, they were once again under attack. Uh, so it's a very serious situation that's going on, a uh, very concerning situation. And, and as many of you already are fully aware, the other big issue, uh, or two big issues, is North Korea, China, and Russia both having uh, a sizable force, uh, especially with Russia having the S-400. They just again moved the S-400 system near the border of North Korea, as well as the Bulk M, uh, which is very capable of taking out uh, cruise missiles that the U.S. uses, the Bulk M is, and China. Uh, we reported this the other day that China was moving even more military up to the Jilin uh, area, which is northern China and northern uh, North Korea, at the very top end of the border there. I did not know if China was putting this in place because maybe they're going to side with President Trump and help uh, President Trump take it down Kim Jong-un, but uh, Russian media got a hold of this as well, the very videos that we were sharing with you that had not made it mainstream media at the time, and Russia said that China was moving in to be able to knock down any type of missiles coming in from the United States into North Korea. So that's Russia's take on that. Uh, and at the same time, Ukraine, it is really becoming a hotbed right now. Russia has moved in more tanks, not into Ukraine, but on a train rail that is uh, uh, down near the southern part of Russia, close to the Ukrainian border, within 30 kilometers. Uh, we see that Russia is very concerned about the United States now willing to put uh, weapons of uh, uh, 
you know, very, very serious, I don't want to say mass destruction, but they're, they're, they're arming and putting in the budget for the U.S. military to put some very lethal weapons into the hands of the Ukrainian government against the Luhansk and uh, Donetsk regions that, are, that have uh, pro uh, proclaimed their autonomy. And of course, we got all the problems going on in Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, the constant military buildup, the U.S. Uh, general up in Norway is telling uh, the, the service, the Marines there to prepare for a big war. Uh, and of course, Chinese President Xi Jinping stating to his own military, uh, I think it's a little bit, a little bit, uh, maybe not exactly the way the military has, has put it. I listened to the uh, the Chinese language and saw the, the translation there. Not saying for them to, that they're going into a major battle right now, but letting them know they need to be prepared for the possibility of an all-out war. All this happening, and uh, Steve, as we were bringing out in the broadcast recently, we were looking at why then, uh, especially in the case of Russia, why would we as a Christian nation, seeing that Russia has come out of the former Soviet Union, we had different leaders, Gorbachev, we had uh, uh, the, the different leaders that have come along, none of them really believers of Yeshua, uh, and then President Putin comes along, former KGB agent, but a firm believer in Yeshua, a churchgoer, uh, very obvious that the Russian media has really covered this uh, and trying to revive back the Russian Orthodox Church there. Now that's his choice of religion. We know that there are other churches, other denominational systems inside of Russia since the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, and as I see this and I think of President Trump and he as well bringing prayer back into the White House. I may not agree with everything that President Trump does, but I guarantee you one thing, it's, it's the first time in a long time that we had a president willing to bring prayer into the White House once again, and then throw out the idols that Obama had, had lavished the White House with. Uh, he was definitely doing a cleansing. So I appreciate that, and as I see this, two Christian nations, and yet the stirring of war. Who is in control? Steve, let's get your way in on this. Well, that's a great question, Stephen, because what you see going on in the United States right now is actually an open civil war. Now, there's not shooting between the North and the South, but there is most assuredly a civil war going on between the deep state and the Trump administration. And the deep state is like a cancerous tumor that has penetrated the whole body. I mean, quite frankly, before Trump got elected, we were, you know, in our fellowship, considering that if Hillary got elected, really the corpse that was so infected with cancer would most assuredly die. There's just no question. The nation could not have sustained another four years of that kind of criminal cabal leadership. And so Trump has done some really some amazing things for the country, but he is doing it in a condition of war against his own CIA, against his own FBI, against his own NSA, against his own DOD. I mean, there were people in the CIA that were openly advocating his that he should be killed. There are people in the FBI, a vast number, some 600 members of the FBI, who were openly conspiring to remove him from office after he was duly elected. He was duly elected by the people of this country and duly elected by the Electoral College. He is the duly elected president, the lawful president of the United States. Unlike Mr. Obama, he's a natural born citizen of the United States, an American citizen who has every legitimate legal right to hold the office. And he obtained the office like the good shepherd. He walked through the gate. And once he did that, the whole approach has been, we have to get him out of there. We have to get him out of there. We have to get, him. well, now what's happened is why did they need to get him out of there? Because he's exposed all of pedo gate. You know, all of these pedophiles that have been, you know, permeated throughout all of these institutions, all of these sexual deviants who are working out of Hollywood, you know, all of the kind of stuff that's been going on under the surface that nobody would dare talk about and that virtually every major network news media outlet would do, would bend over backwards to cover up. And so Mr. Trump has come forward. So he's at war. And so you have a lot of things that are going on inside the Department of Defense that are going uh, they, they have their own mind. They do whatever they want. The CIA has had so much funding that has been, you know, extra uh, judicial funding. That is to say, part of what the CIA does is it moves into an area and it figures out how we're going to fund this. Like, for instance, 
The revolution in Ukraine was funded with counterfeit dollars. Victoria Nuland and her husband arranged to have $100 bills printed in Germany, and they used those counterfeit hundreds to pay the mercenaries in Ukraine to overthrow the lawfully elected government in Ukraine and to install a rogue regime who has extensive deep ties to the Third Reich and the Nazi leadership and who hold national socialist views and anti-Semitic views. Okay, so all of that, but when you're talking about what's going on in Afghanistan, that's being funded with heroin traffic. I mean, come on, you know, the Taliban wiped out the heroin. We came in and completely reinstated a bumper crop of heroin in two years, and we've maintained, supplied, and supported that bumper crop. Now, what's going on in Syria and in Iraq, you know, I, you know, you've talked about this a bit, Stephen, and I think there is something to be said for this. Remember that, you know, when Nebuchadnezzar came into Jerusalem in 586, he took captive the majority of the families out of Jerusalem, and he took them to Babylon. And most of them stayed in Babylon. There were only 45,000 people that came back to Jerusalem during the time of Nehemiah and Ezra to rebuild the, to rebuild the second temple. 45,000 people. Everybody else built homes and settled down, as it says in Jeremiah 29. And they remained in Babylon. And in fact, the, the Babylonian uh, Talmud, uh, you know, was created in Babylon in 380 AD. So, you know, the house of Judaism was in fact in Babylon. And so you had an extensive, a really broad base of Jewish people, primarily Jews, some Levites, but primarily Jews living in what is now modern day Iraq. Now, I think if you were to trace that, you see this propensity to want to love the son. You know, what is the father's name or what is the son's name, if you can tell? And so what you see is you have this movement in Shiite, in the Shiite Islamic world. Now, the Shiite Islamic world differs from the Sunni world in this respect. Muhammad, who preached all day long that, you know, God did not have a son. God had no children. God did not have a son. So guess what? Muhammad had no son. He had a daughter, and, and her name was Fatima. But she had two sons, Hussein and Hassan. Well, when Muhammad died, there was an issue. Does Is his heir a secular heir, i.e. Ali? Or is his heir an heir by blood, i.e. Hussein? Well, Hussein said, I'm the heir by blood. Well, the heir by blood concept, that's Shiite. That's a Shia Islam, is heir by blood. And that's why their holy city is not Mecca, but it was uh, Karbala in, in, uh, in Iraq. Now, that's very interesting. So you have, and the vast majority of people in Iraq are Shia Muslims. They're Shiites. But, the, but, but uh, Saudi Arabia is Sunni. Turkey is Sunni. And here you have in Syria, you have a Sunni majority being led by a Shia minority, Assad being a Shia minority. Yes. So what is so so the vast majority of people in Iraq being Shiite, the form of Islam practiced in Iran being Shiite. So you have Shiite Iran aligned with Shiite Iraq because Obama went in and lost the war that W. Bush had won. And so by doing that, the Shiites took control and they're autonomous to the United States and they are working together with Iran as a Shiite majority and a Shiite majority. And then Steve, let me, let me inject one thing here to kind of that, that really corroborates that, because I one thing I want to just share with people that when you're what you're speaking about right here, if you guys notice that when. The whole issue, and I won't go into the, we're not going to get into this part here, but just wanted to show this here. When you look at when President Trump declares Jerusalem as Israel's capital, and then you look at what Erdogan, President Erdogan of Turkey, a Sunni, when he said East Jerusalem is the capital of the Palestinians, he parrots exactly the covenant that was agreed upon between the Vatican and that of the Israeli uh, leader Shimon Peres at that time. But Iran did not. Iran claimed that all of Jerusalem is a Palestinian capital. The Shiites, who are not in cahoots with the Vatican, and it just goes to corroborate what Steve is saying. And of course, the Saudis also working hand and foot to do exactly what the Jesuits that are trying to control the Israeli government want to do, and that's to take down Iran. So it only shows you, if you really pay attention to what's being said in, in, in the political circles there, that yes, those Sunnis 
totally different. And this is why, like you said, that way they want Assad to go because he is a Shiite and they don't like that. So anyway, just, just want to throw that thought in there for people to think about. Yeah, and he's a Shiite leader that is using the Shiite militia in southern Lebanon known as Hezbollah. Hezbollah is also a Shiite militia. It's armed and funded by Iran. So what you see here is you see the little horn, right? You see the little horn of the beast here, Iran, Iraq, the, Sh the Shia leadership in Syria, and then uh, Hezbollah, the little horn. The, the big horn, of course, is Sunni Islam, which stretches from Indonesia all the way to Morocco. Right. Okay, so... So we have this we have this concept of Sunnism versus Shiite. All right. Now, when you're talking about so it, and the, the top funding agent for terror in the world, you know, we hear it coming out of the lips of everybody in the White House, everybody at the DOD. Oh, Iran is the top agent of terror. Well, that's just not true. It's Saudi Arabia. It always has been. They keep the funding quiet, but they're the ones who put the majority of the funds mm -hmm. behind ISIS. You know, this new king, King Salman, he arrested a bunch of those guys who were putting money directly into ISIS because he had an understanding with President Trump. These guys weren't going to get away with it anymore. But Qatar is in it, UAE is in it, Bahrain's in it, they're, Kuwait's in it. They're all funding this re super radical uh, Sunni extremist group that had, we haven't seen that kind of barbarism out of Islam since Muhammad himself. And so, you know, so this kind of thing, now, when, you when you're talking about approaching the Russian bases, the Russian, you know, remember that Russia is pretty much landlocked. They've got some naval bases in the Black Sea. They have to get Turkey's permission to come through the Bosporus. They have some naval bases out in, you know, Vladivostok and maybe uh, Petropavlos, Kamchatsky, you know, maybe some other right. uh, coastal cities out there. But the, the truth is, in the Pacific side of the ocean, you have to remember that from the Ural Mountains to Vladivostok, there are only 10 million Russians living there, total. Most of Russia, the other 140 million people, live to the west of the Ural Mountains in European Russia, right? Yeah. And so, and they don't have good success in the Pacific Ocean, quite frankly, as as a navy force. They don't. They got thumped by the Japanese in the 19th century in a big way. So, they need. They have to have some kind of a, a, a warm water port, and the warm water port that they have been able to negotiate and hold is in Latakia, there in Syria. And so they have they have no intention of yielding that port, no intention whatsoever. But I got to tell you, when we get into this prophecy here in, in uh, Isaiah 9, Stephen, we're going to hit some very interesting things. And what I wanted to talk about uh, and what, I, what you and I talked about a little bit before is who are these people? Now, when, when you know, I've spent a lot of time looking at scripture, particularly Genesis 49, Genesis 48, Genesis 49, and looking at these this blessing of Yaakov onto the 12 sons. But there's an interesting blessing that happens before in Bereshit 48, Genesis 48, where you have this blessing of Ephraim and Manasseh, and Ephraim being the younger son, Manasseh being the older son. And so you have, so when they're presented, Joseph puts Manasseh on, on uh, Israel's right leg, and he puts Ephraim on the left leg, assuming that Yaakov is going to go, boom, okay, Manasseh blessed, okay, Ephraim blessed. But instead, he crosses his hands. Now, that crossing of the hands becomes extremely important because that crossing of his hands was found on the, is found on the flag of Britain to this day. That's what that cross is. That's the crossing of the hands of Yaakov to bless Ephraim, whose marker was the, well, people say the unicorn, because the unicorn meant the rhinoceros. But, the, but if you look at, at the symbol of uh, England at its coat of arms, you'll find the unicorn and the golden rampant lion. That's a mix between Ephraim and Judah. Okay, so what you see here is that this blessing goes on Ephraim. He says, you will be, Melo Goim, you will be a great company of nations. It's interpreted in English. But Manasseh, you will be a great nation. Now that's singular, great nation. Okay, now this is, is, this is going to play out in historically. Historically, you're going to be able to see this very clearly. One becomes a company of nations. One becomes a great nation. Okay. Now that's the difference. Now, in the case of Manasseh, Manasseh is very interesting because Manasseh is split in two ways. You had Manasseh with a little land grant to the west of the Jordan, and then you had the larger Manasseh, which was given really a uh, Bashan. It was given a Bashan, and so uh, the Manasseh that was in Bashan, they were placed there for a reason because they were ferocious fighters. And so you want to come in here, Assyria, you want to come in here, Persia, you want to come in here, Babylon. You're gonna have to take on Manasseh first. They're pretty bad. 
Well, Menasha was conquered by Assyria because Assyria invented the compound bow and whose firepower was exceeded only by the weapons of World War I. And so the Assyrians came in and they took on Menasha. Well, Menasha, eastern Menasha, now was dispersed and was taken east of Assyria. Well, that east of Assyria was to the other side of what is now the Caspian Sea. Now, this tribe uh, grew and became very ferocious, very fierce tribe of people. They were the ones who killed Alexander the Great in Afghanistan, the Masajeti. They killed Alexander the Great in Afghanistan, and they proceeded to populate now this whole area, what is now Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, southern, the steppes of Russia, and even up into Mongolia. And in fact, I was reading an article here today that was published in RT this morning about a find of a, 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 an infant girl in the central Alaska, in central Alaska, and they found it, and it, it co corroborates DNA showing that there was migration out of Asia across the ice bridge, not the land bridge, the ice bridge, you can walk it in the winter right now. If they crossed the ice bridge into Alaska, well, those tribes would later become the Athabascans, the Klingits, they would become the Apache, the Navajo, the Arapaho. This is all Menasha. Now, this is the work of uh, Megid ben Yosef, Megid ben Yosef, who taught at Hebrew University for a long time, and he uses the Torah uh, to demonstrate that, in fact, these Native American tribes are Menasha. Wow. But what you see is this fighting capability, right? Horseback riding, shooting with a powerful bow, of uh, you know, fighting from horseback with expert horsemanship and so forth. This was the mark of Menasha. Okay. Well, what do you see from Menasha? Well, Menasha under Genghis Khan, who I believe the Mongols were Menasha, that tribe now in the, in the 13th century begins to expand out of Mongolia. And they expand robustly. They expand all through all of civilized Russia. They captured at the time what was the, which was Razan, which was the capital of Russia at the time. So Russia's initial capital was Razan, then Vladimir, then Moscow. And Razan is uh, just a little bit to the east of, of uh, Moscow. They captured Razan, and they even went so far as to catch Novgorod, capture Novgorod, which is just south of what is now modern-day St. Petersburg. They captured Kiev and completely destroyed it. They captured all of Georgia, Azerbaijan, and Armenia. They captured most of the Anatolian Peninsula, that is to say modern Turkey. They captured half of Iraq, all of Persia, most of Pakistan, you know, and what are, what are modern day countries under the Khans. And so these Mongol people now controlled this thing for several centuries. And the people who were living there, many of them were just killed. There were only a couple hundred people in Kiev by the time the Khans were through. So what do you think happened? There was cross breeding and there was a lot of cross breeding. And so what you see is, is that this, these Masajete who would become the Mongols who were described uh, oftentimes in uh, the Quran as Gog and Magog, what you see is the, this tribe now becomes a very significant tribe holding Russia. Now, the leadership would eventually change because you had this leadership, this Nordic leadership that was being inbred into this house of Menasha. And who? what was that Nordic leadership? Primarily the house of Judah that was being inbred into the house of Menasha. And this then becomes the powerhouse that is Russia. And by the time that uh, Moscow emerges as the capital there, you see this compete be competition between Mos Moscow and Astrakhan, which was the Mongol capital in the Caspian Sea. And eventually, under Ivan the Terrible, the Mongols are defeated. And so, so now, so what I'm saying to you is, is that modern Russia is Menasha. Now, there's elements of Menasha in the United States, for, cer for certain, but, but the nation of Menasha is modern Russia. Now, if you look at that, what happens historically? Well, Russia spends all of its time expanding its territory. I mean, they're the ones that said, we've got to have all of this north. No one else, you know, China doesn't want that Siberia, but Russia will take it. Just as Menasha had to have a greater land grant up there in Bashan, so Menasha has to have a greater land grant. And when they conquer, it becomes a singular nation. So when you get to the Soviet Union, you have the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, known as the Soviet Union, a singular nation. You remember, you remember it on your map? It was all pink, remember? Yes, yes. And because it was a singular nation. Now let's compare that to Ephraim, which is Britain. Compare that to Ephraim. Ephraim goes out, 
They colonized India, they colonized Kenya, they colonized South Africa, they colonized Australia, they colonized Canada. The sun doesn't set on Britain, but it's a company of nations. It's not a singular nation. It's a company of nations. And it, would, it, and it says Ephraim will rule over the brother, right? Ephraim will rule over the brother. But in Genesis 49, it says Judah will rule over Ephraim in the respect that Judah will always have a lawgiver between his feet and a scepter in his hand. These are important concepts to know that the blessings of Yaakov in Genesis 49 continue to even today. And they're markers about the geodynamics and the political shaping of what's happening now. So people say, well, look, the, those old Soviets, you know, uh, Vladimir Putin was a KGB agent. You can't trust him as far as you can throw. Him. Now, I have to tell you. You know, I was in Georgia in 2006, and I made a statement. I was t preaching in the church. This is Gruzia, not, not Georgia in America, but in Tbilisi. And I'm preaching in the church, and I made some remarks in Russian. And I didn't know at the time. I thought I was teaching, talking to a little church. Of course, this is in the ex-Soviet Union. So, of course, there were microphones throughout the whole building. They were ta listening to everything. You know, the Russians were listening. The Georgians were listening. Well, anyway, they heard me make this remark in Russian. They didn't like it. And so this uh, this governor of Chechnya, Ruslan Kadyrov, uh, shuts down the natural gas to Georgia for all 12 days that I'm there, which was in the middle of January. So it was we were in the cold and the dark for 12 days. You know, I think I fell down, I don't know, two or three hills in the Jeez. snow. <laughs> it was. Yeah, it was pretty wild. And uh, but at any rate, uh, you know, so the, the thing is. At that time, I don't believe Vladimir Putin uh, had come out of his secularness as a post-communist, okay? But right after that, the remark that I made in Georgia, which he heard, Ruslan Kadyrov heard it and Vladimir Putin heard it. I said, Gavrit imu Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin. Menyazovut Putin, ya yesum put. My name is Putin, I am the way. And then I said, niet, niet, niet. No, thus says Yeshua, Isus, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father through but through me. Yes. Well, that remark, well, Ruslan Kadyrov said, that's it. Shut him down, right? Take it to black. Take it to black. And they did. They got cold. And there was 12 inches of snow on the ground. I look out of my hotel. The whole city is black, right? Just black. Not, not a single light. And uh, so anyway, but it was after that that Putin came to recognize. And, he, and because Putin is a brilliant man. And he came to recognize, look, Russia is going to die because they had the lowest birth rate in the civilized world. They had a 0.6 birth rate. They were losing a million people a year. By 2070, there wouldn't be a Russian living in Russia. They couldn't populate the Siberia. They couldn't get people to have kids. So he introduces this program. Look, stop it. The average Russian woman has eight abortions. The average Russian woman, eight abortions. And so, it's, so Putin comes in and says, look, you have kids, I'll give you some money. You have a second kid, I'll give you more. Right. So he has this, he brings in this childbearing program. Then he comes to realize the way, the truth, and the life. He comes to realize that it was orthodoxy that made Russia a great nation. Yes. And and the whole and if you know the history of Russia, when I got to Moscow, I mean, I'm thinking, you know, here I am. I was an anti-communist. You know, I get into Moscow. I'm thinking these guys let me in here. I'm, I'm the world's biggest anti-communist. What are they doing doing that? Right. And my tour guide says, look, Stephen, Moscow, before the assassination of the czars, had the most number of churches of any city on earth. Wow. I see, see, a lot of people don't know this, Steve. They have no idea the historical value of Christianity in this country. I mean, they were evangelizing China under the Tsars. Yeah, well, I, I'm telling you, this, and, and the Orthodox monks, these guys would... They would just go out into the most hostile possible climate you could imagine. I mean, just the ends of the earth. And they'd show up and they'd say, well, let's build a church here, right? And these guys weren't making any money. You know, this was the Russian way. Yeah, go out there, see if you can make it. Okay, I'll go out there and fast, you know, 180 days a year. I'll eat whatever happens to show up and let's build a church. 
You know, when uh, Father Alexander uh, from the Orthodox Church in St. Petersburg came to visit me here in Washington, he walks into this church I was attending at the time that had 2,000 people attending it every weekend. He says, Stephen, how do you get so many people in this building? I said, Father Alexander, I'll give you two words, two tips. Heat chairs. You know, the, Rus the Russian churches <laughs> have neither of those, right? Uh, so, so I'm taking on this tour into the Kremlin. I go into the Kremlin, and what do I find in the Kremlin? I'm thinking, these guys have let me into the Kremlin? Yeah, we get into the Kremlin. We go to the church of Ivan the Terrible. We go to the church of St. Michael. We go to the church of the Assumption. We go to the church of the Annunciation. These are major churches where all the patriarchs of the uh, Russian Orthodox Church are buried, all the czars are buried, all the czars' children were baptized, all inside the Kremlin. The first move after the Soviet Union fell, there was a fellow named Yuri Lushkov. He becomes the mayor of Moscow. The first thing he did when the money started coming in was to tear out Stalin's swimming pool and rebuild the Church of Christ our Savior, the most important church in Russia today. This is the church that you see the patriarch doing the services and Vladimir Putin who shows up. That's in the Church of Christ our Savior that was torn down by Joseph Stalin to build a palace of the Soviets, rebuilt under Vladimir Putin under the leadership of Yuri Lushkov who also rebuilt a half a dozen of the churches right there on Red Square. They've remodeled the church of, you know, the San Basilio Basilio Sabor, the St. Basil's Cathedral there in the square. They've opened up St. Isaac's in St. Petersburg, the Kazakh Kazan uh, Cathedral in St. Petersburg is open, church on spilled blood. I toured a church in Kursk that is the third most important church in Russia. Absolutely spectacular church. And I think it was the only American who ever set foot inside of that building. Wow. And, you know, so when you said, so what I discovered was once they took that famine, and it was a famine of 70 years, 1921 to 1991, that the word was taken away from them. It was a famine of the word for 70 years and 60 million people died. Now, we in America think that this hasn't happened to us. Well, we're wrong. There's been a famine here for 70 years from 1948 till now, and there's 60 million dead babies in this country yes. and a famine of the word going on. Yes. Yes, exactly. You know? So, so what you see is, yes, now it's an orthodox nation. Now, am I 100% approving of orthodoxy? No. I mean, look, there's icon worship that goes on. And, and, and in particular, I'm not going to denounce the icons, okay? I'm not an iconoclast. But when you're kissing the icon of the virgin and baby, that is nyet, nyet, nyet. You know, that shouldn't be done, okay? Uh, the, the lifting up of the Easter egg. No, Babylonian, you know, uh, the celebration of Christmas. No, Babylonian. But they keep the Passover. And mm -hmm. in the Russian Orthodox Church, they keep Shavuot. They keep Shavuot. They keep Matzah. They just don't keep the fall feasts. In Russia, the name for Saturday is Suboto. Yes. Sabbath. Yes. Right? Yes. And so, so you know, so... And, uh, so and uh, this is something else, too. When you talk about in Russia, in terms of the holiness, right? Sunday, the word for Sunday in Russian is Vaskreshenya, which means resurrection, right? Kres, the cross. Kreshenya, baptism. Vaskreshenya, resurrection. So I tell my Russian friends, Christos Vaskres, Lenin Yeshu Sokrabnitsya. Christ has risen. Lenin is still in the tomb. Exactly. Exactly. And so, you know, friends, this is the point that uh, reason, one of the reasons why I wanted to have uh, Dr. Pitching come here on Israeli News Live is to give you more of the perspective of what's really going on in Russia and the truth about Russia because the Russians, even under this oppression for 70 years, the Orthodox believer there, uh, and of course, many different types of believers, but just saying, for example, the Orthodox uh, believers, they were never fully crushed. They just had to do everything in secret. Uh, even as my wife would share with me about her own experience uh, when she was under the Soviet Union as well, everything was done in secret if you were a believer in the Messiah. And that's the same thing that we're seeing today. And so the question comes up then is, why then are we warring with one, with one another? Why is it that for some reason here in the modern age that we are living in when at one point it looked like 
Uh, the United States and Russia were going to finally become more of an ally uh, to, to one another. I mean, we realize even when they were the Soviet Union, uh, they did ally in World War II, etc. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about you have two nations that share a common past. Both of these nations are believers, believers of Yeshua, you know, and both of them actually have a past as part of the house of Israel who are still dispersed from the homeland. So there must come a time where something is going to change. And why are we living in this day when we're willing uh, and it's being brought out publicly, especially such an, a, a hatred towards Russia right now that is being brought out in mainstream media that we need to crush Russia, they're meddling in our politics, there's a cry for war, uh, there's been a cry for war for some time, and that cry always comes from Rome. Friends, stay with us just for a moment here, we're going to take a quick break, and we will be right back.